Welcome, bienvenidos, bienvenidos. My name is Rodrigo Moura. I'm the chief curator of El Museo del Barrio. And tonight I'm pleased to provide you with an introduction to our panel with artist and photographer Sebastian Hidalgo and Star Montana, mediated by El Museo's curator, Susana Tempke. It's a pleasure to have you as uh, an audience and it's a pleasure to have them as our speakers tonight. Together with Tamkin, we are the co-organizers of Enfoco, the New York Puerto Rican Experience, 1973-1974. The exhibition that we have now on view at El Museo, together with popular painters and other visionaries, and around which this talk tonight, portraying our communities, Latinx photography, past and present, is centered and inspired by. Latinx photography has been in the DNA of El Museo since its very first year. And this exhibition offer both a celebration and a re reconsideration of this legacy. Uh, and FOCO, the New York Puerto Rican experience, 1973-74, centers on the documentary portfolio by the photograph photographic collective in FOCO featuring 79 images by founding members Charles Biazini Rivera, Roger Caban, and Felipe Dante. The portfolio was the first project by the Bronx-based organization established in 1974 as part of the New York New Yorican art movement. Gifted by Enfoco to El Museo del Barrio's permanent collection in 1976, Selected images of this portfolio have been included in various exhibitions over the decades. However, now it is on view in its entirety for the first time since 1978. Also, it is important to mention that this exhibition is the second in a series that reconsider El Museo del Barrio's early history and its foundational values, including Tayer Boricua, a political workshop in New York presented in in 2020, and the upcoming Rafael Montañez Ortiz, a contextual retrospective in 2022. Created in response to negative images of Puerto Ricans and their exclusion from local cultural institutions, the images in the portfolio were photographed over the course of two years. Each of the photographers followed their own individual vision, turning their lenses to three different themes labor with Felipe Dante, small business with Roger Caban, and education with Charles Biazini Rivera. The resulting images offer a rich visual testament of New York's Puerto Rican population in the 70s, both in urban and rural settings. Together, they articulate a range of photographic approaches and vocabulary, including street photography, portraiture, and documentary. Presented as a complete set with an exhibition design inspired by the graphic identity of the portfolio itself, each of the photo photographers' work have been separated in different black areas as if, as if they are sheets composition in a specialized graphic space. The narratives emerge and fade across the three themes which touch on complex topics such as integration, pride, and cultural specificity. Historically, the portfolio also relates and reacts to photographic precedents in the US, precedents in the US and Puerto Rico, such as the propagandistic Our Lands and Their People as seen with camera and pencil, the New Deal's Farm Security Administration Photography Program, and uh, specifically Bruce Davidson, East 100th Street, uh, shot by Davidson between 1966 and 68 in East Harlem. What differentiates the Infoco images from these earlier projects is a sense of shared community between subjects and photographers representing their own lived reality. So here we have a general view of the installation in our galleries. Uh, something that I mentioned before, the separation uh, between the photographers and their respective uh, themes. So here's, here's the section uh, dedicated to uh, Felipe Dante and, lab and labor. Uh, it's a close up of uh, our installation view with uh, images uh, from um, uh, 
of uh, Phil Dante's work, upstate New York with migrant farmer workers, including the work in the field as well as their uh, quarters. Uh, here we continue with the farm workers, uh, but also entering into uh, urban uh, New York City uh, labor, including uh, where, uh, warehouse and, um, and packaging uh, jobs in the city, as well as the garment district. And uh, more towards the end of the hanging, we have a uh, wonderful grouping of uh, individual portraits of uh, young, uh, up and coming, emergent uh, professionals in different uh, roles in the creative industry in New York. But as we can also see from the images on the third uh, grouping on, your, on the right, we have also uh, the hardships of like employment seeking and a uh, strike taking place uh, as part of this series uh, of uh, documentation of labor. Uh, continuing, we have uh, the small business uh, section by Roger Caban uh, with a very interesting uh, eye for detail in his photographs. So we have um, a large suite dedicated to a barber shop in El Barrio, Villa's barber shop, beginning with uh, portraits of the uh, of the barber owner of the shop, and uh, following with uh, both more communal communal images and social activities uh, represented and taking place in the space of the barber as well uh, at the barber shop as well as with uh, more like detailed uh, images and still life still life compositions mm -hmm. of objects uh, arranged in that space uh, and we continue with uh, more almost uh, rite of passages uh, with the, your haircut taking place and uh, different leisure activities music and um, and uh, leisure games taking place in the space of the barber shop, and we we finalize also uh, the section with a number of images of uh, facades and interiors and street vendors in different parts of New York City. Uh, also referencing this moment uh, in history and cultural uh, co visual culture in New York where uh, we could really see a Latinization of the city being embedded with different visual codes coming from uh, the diasporic culture in, in, in New York, in the city. Uh, another uh, general view where we can see uh, the, you know, the sort of breakdown of the, of the hanging in different uh, sections dedicated to each of the uh, photographers. Uh, now on to uh, Charles Biasini Rivera's uh, group, group of works and images uh, dedicated to education. Uh, so we have a, we have a large uh, suite of uh, photographs that took place, uh, were made in the Benjamin Franklin High School in this Harlem, uh, where we see both portraits as well as an interest for the institutional architectural space as uh, as the container for different uh, social activities. Uh, we follow uh, these images with uh, other uh, more like out, outdoor, out, uh, outside views of uh, the community action uh, group demonstrations. Uh, as we can imagine, uh, probably, uh, pressuring the schools for uh, bilingual education, for instance. Also, we have uh, adult education with the night school in upstate New York in Newburgh. And we uh, finished the series with uh, a suite of uh, graduation scene on an elementary school in New York City. Uh, so this exhibition, uh, it's on view at El Museo until uh, the end of uh, February, February 27th. And in addition to the portfolio, the show is uh, supplemented by uh, 
substantial group of posters, exhibition catalogs, and other ephemera related to and focus historical engagement with El Museo. A photo book will be published in winter 2021. Uh, featuring uh, reproductions of all images, archival materials, and a newly commissioned scholarly essay, as well as historical texts. So uh, with that, I will leave you with Susanna Temkin, Star Montana, uh, and uh, Sebastian Hidalgo uh, on uh, portraying our community's Latinx photography past and present. Thank you so much and a wonderful program, everyone. For joining us tonight. I'm Susanna Temkin. I am a curator at El Museo and co-curator with Rodrigo Mora on Enfoco, the New York Puerto Rican experience. I hope you all enjoyed um, that brief walkthrough, but as I think you had a sense, um, there are 79 photographs in the exhibition. So I invite you all to El Museo um, if you're in New York or when you're in New York. We'll have the opportunity to really analyze each of the individual photographs in detail um, from the, the still life to the pure portraiture to um, all of the images of New York City and its wider communities of um, Puerto Ricans living throughout the state. Um, with that said, I am so happy to be here tonight with Sebastian Hidalgo and Star Montana, who I invite to um, turn on their cameras and join me in tonight's presentation. Um, hi, Sebastian. Hi, Star. And this is the first program that we are hosting um, in conjunction with the Enfoco exhibition. And something that we really were very keen to highlight is um, the ongoing his history of Latinx photography, which, of course, has very excitedly been the subject of recent um, books. Um, the new Aperture issue that's just out is focusing on Latinx photography. And we really wanted to be able to connect, um, not the earliest moment, but an, an earlier moment in the 1970s via Enfoco with um, two artists working today who are both um, turning their lenses to their own communities. So uh, I, the procedure we're going to do today is I'm going to turn it over to Sebastian, who is um, based out of the, the greater Chicago area with an interest in Pilsen, um, where he grew up, uh, followed by Star Montana, who will be taking us through her practice, largely based in her hometown of Boyle Heights in East Los Angeles. And then we'll all come together um, and have a conversation. And I really want to invite you as the audience to please submit your question and answers, um, either using the Q&A feature or the chat. I see we have a lot of photographers um, in the audience. So I think this would be a really dynamic conversation that you know, please feel free to be a part of. You don't have to wait till the end. Um, you can submit your questions as we go. So Sebastian, are you ready to take it away and, and give us a little introduction into, a brief introduction into um, your practice and, and how you are producing your work? Yes, absolutely. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you, Susana, for a lovely introduction. Uh, I'm going to share my screen real quick just to make sure that everything is going good. So just a minute, please. Um, <clears throat> okay. There it is. All right. Just let me know if uh, if you can all see that. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sebastian. I'm a photojournalist by trade and current National Geographic explorer. Uh, as Susana said, I'm based in Chicago. Um, and a lot of what my work focuses on is this really general idea of, of home or reshaping home or dissecting the meaning of home. And, and I think for me, that's, it's really intentional because it allows me to study and flex, uh, you know, all the moving elements that prevent or create us from a quality of life. Um, but my work 
and what drives me or what influenced me was my upbringing, Pilsen in, in particular. Um, I think growing up, uh, art and reading was really encouraged in my household, um, and but it was often used as a uh, as a scapegoat just to prevent us from um, from going outside or uh, keeping us safe to some degree growing up. Um, so you know. Growing up, there was a lot of time where I would spend just drawing and reading and, and just doing arts and crafts and all that stuff. But the most significant part of my photographic practice, uh, you know, or where I discovered photography in particular was in 2008, uh, when I was uh, uh, living in, in Mexico with my mother, uh, in between the, the US-Mexican border, we were taking care of my grandfather at the time. And, um, you know, being the youngest of three children, yeah, I went wherever she went. So it so happened that that also included being in the same room uh, when, my, when my grandfather passed. Um, and, and I think in retrospect, I was probably a little too young to experience something like that, but it wasn't, it wasn't a, uh, a horrific sight. It was it was a very beautiful passing, and and for me it acted as a as a sort of a guide, or it gave me a lasting impression of all the lessons that my grandfather had taught me, uh, or just our family history in general, uh, which would be represented in these two images uh, here, uh, which were one of the first images that I took uh, during that time. Um, so, you know, when my grandfather passed, my uncle, he tasked me with, with documenting everything afterwards, a week the morning process. And I think a part of him giving, you know, a child a camera was because he wanted time to mourn his own, his own father. Uh, and for me, it was, it was the, the thing that really helped me communicate the thing that I saw and the, and the thing that I wanted to communicate uh, to my two older brothers who who weren't in that room, uh, I wanted to share you know the the lessons that I learned that day with them and 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 I think since then I've haven't really stopped doing that. Um, you know, I, to some degree, I'm I'm still in that. I'm still trying to document everything that I possibly can, um, but eventually, oops. Eventually, we moved back to Pilsen and obviously changed people. Um, you know, I came back, uh, went back to the same school in, in Pilsen with an overwhelming uh, sense of curiosity uh, of the neighborhood that we called home for over 30, 40 plus years. Um, and, you know, I began to read as much books about it. Uh, taking street photography, getting lost in the street, talking to elders who really represented or mirrored a sentence in books that I often came across, which to summarize would be that Chicago is, or the Mexican experience in particular in Chicago is misunderstood or overlooked. Um, or as one scholar told me, uh, uh, Pilsen is far from heaven or too close to the loop which is trying to answer the reasons why to the questions that I was asking. Um, and, you know, having developed that sort of lens or, or developing a, a worldview, I started looking at, you know, beloved movies that we saw growing up, Stand and Deliver, uh, Smoke Signals, Mi Familia, Blood and Blood Out, like all great, great movies, but there was something, you know, missing from those things and um, that didn't quite, resemble what I was going through or what my brothers or my friends were going through in Chicago or cold winters, right? Um, so just to kind of uh, make up for, for that, I just want to quickly just dissect where we are. Uh, Pilsen is located just a few miles from the loop or the downtown area of Chicago, um, you know, together with Little Village, and in Cicero make up what we consider the Mexican Mecca of the Midwest. Um, in the mid to late 20th century, which is not that long ago, 
uh, millions of families migrated into that area to seek employment, uh, to seek a, a better future for their family, or were literally forced there with the construction of major highways and universities. Um, in the 80s, the population reached its peak and was predominantly made up of, of young people ever since. But the challenges uh, that many families found themselves in uh, remain and, and persisted throughout the years, which is represented to the map on the right um, by the National Resource Defense Council as being one of the most burdensome uh, areas in the entire city, which is you know highlighted in, in deep red tones. This map was created in uh, 2018 and updated in 2019. And in 2020, um, it, the Chicago Air Quality Report, excuse me on that one, um, shared the same thing. You know, Pilsen, Little Village, the, the, the Mexican Mecca uh, per se, continue to be highlighted in those deep, deep red tones. Um, but you know, in the 80s and, and during that time, Pilsen was really uh, demonized and, and uh, the narratives that were coming out of, out of the neighborhood were really focused on the violence, on the gangs and all that stuff. And, and the news clipping on, on the far left, it, you know, it, it describes you know, the images of, or the uh, shootings of, of 18th Street and, and you know, really describes something like people getting shot with smiles on their faces. And, and it was just kind of horrible and, and misleading. And on top of that, you had developers converting buildings uh, in areas that, you know, are, are very gentrified now um, back then. So the gears of gentrification were already starting there. And, you know, we didn't know at the time, but it would later lead on to what we, um, um, into our displacement. So, uh, in one of the many books that I described earlier, Describing the Mexican experience in Chicago, authors write that amid these challenges, uh, families decided to regardless create resources for community members, for the community, community members and by community members. Um, and the authors really described it as, or some people viewed it as a political stance doing something like that, but doesn't really go in specifics on, on who was looking at it that way. And for me, having growing up in, in, in that community, it wasn't intentionally a, a political stance. I think if, if anything, um, it was just the need, it was just survival. It's the thing that we, that we did, right? Um, so everything began to change soon after that. Um, gentrification took on a lot of forms. And at first it was uh, seeing joggers run in, in Harrison Park or what some residents refer to as Zapata Park, uh, you know, at night or in the evening or the police being called for loud noises for things that we were already accustomed to, uh, which was things that we were never taught to do. You know, we, uh, we just thought it was normal and, and seeing, you know, people jog and stuff like that, just little tiny details was, was extremely bizarre for a lot of folks. Um, but soon after that, the rents went up and eventually families left. Uh, and in my first project, which is titled The Quietest Form of Displacement in a Changing Barrio, uh, documents the existing community or, and reports on the internally displaced person or the silent form of, of displacement during this, this period of time. Um, it took me about two years to really intentionally uh, report on that, but this is a, a, a project that you know, I've been documenting for, um, for a couple of years now. Um, and I really wanted to show you know, what it felt like or, or to feel homesick in a community that you were standing in. You know, uh, that's that's something that uh, I found that never just went away. It was kind of like a thorn in your boot. It was 
irritating. It was always there. It was always present. Um, you know, and and really affirmed when murals were being painted over in, in, in grayer or white um, paint, you know, erasing entire histories or replaced with something really artificial or, or just, uh, you know, erasing history. Um, mom and pop stores also closed and turned into to restaurants with valet parking, right, which signaled to residents that they were never considered a part of these plans. Um, and the sounds of, of homes and of children playing and, and the things that we growing accustomed to slowly started fading away. And recently I asked uh, my community uh, members to share something, um, a moment or a place that uh, that they cherish growing up. And I'll, I won't read this for the sake of time, but you kind of get the idea that there are really just everyday things that no longer exist in Pilsen. Um, yeah, so it's another response from a, from a resident who currently lives in Pilsen. Uh, but also one of the elements of being in, displaced in Pilsen was due to shared experience that uh, that isolate residents to one another. Uh, it, in other words, it became really difficult to establish relationships with newcomers who, who didn't share those experiences growing up in, in Pilsen. Or even if they did share uh, violent experiences in Pilsen, they had the opportunity to leave, which was in itself uh, kind of, uh, you know, violent, I would say. Um, So Dan, I just want yeah. to give you a quick time check to make sure that we have time for star as well. So not, not to rush if you want to take two more minutes and we'll switch. Okay, I'm going to power through it real quick. Um, I just want to say that some of these uh, narratives continue to, to persist even today, um, you know, in, in gatherings or in rallies where families were being uh made up the majority of people you still had a, a response from uh the police force in riot gears and it kind of created this contrasty uh thing where you know this is you know there are two different worlds here uh, and everything that i was really reading early on uh was was very true it's just that we were very misunderstood and overlooked um so the practice of it you know, it really influenced everything that I did for projects and even just things that I was assigned to take an image of, uh, including child laborers living in the shadows, uh, you know, people struggling to make a decision, uh, reunions uh, during the last four years of, of living in the United States, which one of the most violent years for us, um, or, you know, to the sense of resilience and you know, poquito a poquito se llena el cantanito kind of phrases, you know, I wanted to make an, an image of, of certain things like that. Um, currently, I'm working in a little village, looking at a closer look at that app that I showed earlier. Uh, and you can visit the work of, of, of my collaborators at City Bureau uh, in the Southside Weekly um, uh, page or, you know, uh, local papers. So if you're curious to know more about that work, which I didn't get into for this particular presentation, you can follow me on Instagram or, or Twitter or, or reach out to me, uh, you know, to talk about it a little bit more if you're interested in being involved. Um, I really believe that we can learn from one another. Uh, and if you're curious just to learn a little bit more about our experiences here in Chicago, you know, I want to recommend some books to y'all. Um, so yes, I don't want to take up too much time, but thank you all for, for bearing with me with that one. Um, yes, Dan, that was great. And, um, well, we'll get into it when we get into the Q and A, but, um, I really love that you brought up some of these older images that were, um, not always showing the beauty within communities. It, and it reminds me a lot of, um, 
what Rodrigo mentioned in the intro as in Foco as a reaction to previous images like the Bruce Davidson image. And I wanna also share um, the wonderful Phil Dante essay that was written in, react in reaction to um, Bruce Davidson that's called, But Where Is Our Soul? Um, and it's available on the New York Times. But I think we'll get back to that. Um, more food for thought in a minute. And I wanna invite Sar um, to take over and tell us a little bit about your work. Um, I think you're muted. <laughs> oh, sorry. I had a hiccup like right when I was saying hi. Uh, <laughs> all right. Let me share my screen. Okay. And then share. Okay. You could see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay. I think so. Okay. So let me put a timer for myself. All right. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to talk about um, my current body of work that is transitioning to part two. So I had to put the title because I always stumble on my own title. Um, oh, and first, I want to just acknowledge the death of the bell hooks. It's just like a really sad day. And it's just, ugh, it's so heartbreaking. So, you know, I just want to say like, you know, power to her and it just, you know, to dismantle the imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchal, you know, powers all around the world. You know, she taught me so much. So, you know, rest in power, bell hooks. And I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge her. Um, so, um yeah so the name of the body of um my body of work is um by the river i stood and stared into the sun um and so let's get into it um and yeah sorry i i want to make sure we have time to look at the work um there's a lot about it and about the title but you know this is just a quick overview so first i want to show the how it looks. It's an installation based work. Um, there's work, it's it's a mixture. Um, and my curator, I know she's on the Zoom, and I wouldn't have been able to do this without Anna Breeze, who was my curator, who continues to be my curator and my partner um, in a lot of my work. Um, so this has been work that I've been working on since 2000. Uh, 11, um, probably even the thought process before that, a lot of my projects take um, lots of years, at least five years to even like finish um, or like from start to finish this, um, you know, and so this one, I had started thinking about something that you guys will see later. Um, and so most of these works on this piece, you know, each, each wall had a piece of it that we um, did installation. And so these are archival pieces of family members. And then there's one image that you'll see that I, I photographed. And so we were connecting them. I think of them as, um, you know, hymns or psalms, you know, biblical references. I'm not religious, but my family grew up Catholic. Um, I'm uh, Mexican descent, uh, diasporic in from Boyle Heights. Um, so, you know, there's Catholicism all around. Um, so I think of them as really sad hymns. Um, and so they connect, you know, the diasporic journey from Mexico to El Paso, and then from El Paso in 1945 after the war um, to Boyle Heights. And then so this is mostly dealing with the femmes in my family and, you know, their identity. So we'll go you know, so this is them leading, leaving in 1945. This is my grandmother to the left, and this is her three children. Um, she had another one that is still alive. The rest on the right are all have all passed away um, due to systematic um, systematic racism and just uh, medical uh, drug violence, um, gang violence. But you know, all of it has to do with systematic racism. Um, this is my grandmother to the left. This is my mother and her brother to the right. Um, this is me to the left, still alive and existing. This is my grandmother. I had never known my grandmother as somebody younger until I finally was able to see these images. Um, this is the only picture in that piece. Um, and then this, this is a like kind of like 
when you look at it as a whole piece and the installation is kind of where you're imagining all these archival images are coming from because it's like kind of a hoarder table. Um, this is a really popular picture. This is my mother and a lot of people assume my father. It's not my father. It's just one of my mother's lovers. My mother was very popular. She had a lot of boyfriends in her lifetime. This is my mother um, caressing me and giving me um, a kiss to the left. This is me and um, recreating like uh, the lovers I had when I was younger, but I don't have any more of those pictures because I ripped them all up. Um, and then this is number two. So this is the second piece where I then now include death, mourning, um, males in my family. Um, so then again, you kind of see everything going on. Okay. So it opens up with a picture with me and it's a really complicated picture. This picture has become very sad over time. It's my mother, top is my uncle, uh, to the right is my cousin. Now all three of those people are dead. I'm the only one alive. So it's very sad to me, but like there was a time when I loved this picture. I still love it, but it's just mournful. To the right, it's uh, showing a lot in a, in a cemetery and the X marks the spot where a lot of people are buried there. It's a picture of my grandmother and me confronting her. Um, when I was putting this exhibition together for the second time at a gallery, I found out my grandmother had died. A family member had been keeping her from me. So it was very emotional, still very emotional, me seeing this. And then this is me confronting the house of my grandmother where a lot of trauma happened to everybody. And so me confronting the, the camera. And so this is a duality that in this, they play off each other. This is my grandmother's hoarder's house where um, I took off aluminum from the window after like 35 years where it's all dust. Okay, I know, I think I have one more minute. This is a picture that now has become a mural that's 20 by 30. Um, it's like, you know, in this one, you can't really see anything, but it's really beautiful if you can actually see it. Whereas this one, you know, it's this, um, you know, when you're in diaspora and you're imagining what will Los Angeles be like and you're going there, this is like kind of the idealistic image. Um, and then this is kind of the reality. It's a very beautiful picture. Um, this is my cousin to the left that was murdered. This is the first person to the right that brought us to Los Angeles, my great grandfather. Um, this is a makeshift memorial that I saw um, uh, where my family, we've mostly lived in Boyle Heights um, and a few people have been murdered around that area. And so I really like that makeshift memorial because um, unfortunately my family, every time we try to do memorials, when those people were murdered, they got um, vandalized. This is my brother who I love so much. He's my everything. And then this is my nephew. This is then kind of uh, the other part. I'll show this really quickly. This is just the images. This is the room that within that exhibition I dedicated to my mom in the style of Warhol, but not, I just thought about, you know, why is it only famous people that then we kind of icona, iconize. So it's my mother um, and then just, uh, humanizing her. So there's the icon shot and then the everydayness. Um, this is the second part of that work. So that was one part. And now this is work that nobody has seen yet. So um, this is work that I've slowly started to work on. So this is, again, being in diaspora. There, we're always going to be in diaspora. Um, so this is kind of where, when I'm tracing everything, this is where we started, Mexico City. And then this is me now being, we've always lived near ri rivers from my research. So this is me existing in that. This is another river. This is in the suburbs of Los Angeles or outside the suburbs. This is another river. This is the San Gabriel River. This is my nephew in the Rio Hondo. Um, and if you look a little bit, it's like really gross, but he's also drawn to the water like me. Um, this is the LA River, you know, and it's been colonized. Um, and then this is the last one of me in the LA River. Um, and so I'm going to figure it out. Um, but this is the beginning of the second part of that. So, yeah. Thank you, Star. And <laughs> I think it's um, 
super exciting for us and like a real honor that you um, kind of are debuting or previewing some of these images um, from this new chapter in your ongoing um, narrative, I guess we can call it. So um, Sebastian, if you wanna come back on, I'd love for us to begin the conversational um, aspect of tonight's event. And again, a reminder to those of you in the audience to please feel free to jump in. I, I really miss being together at conferences and panels in, in body, um, but you know we can do the best we can. So please, again, don't feel like you have to wait until the end to be part of the conversation. Um, I have many, many questions for both of you, um, but maybe I'll start. I'm struck with how um, so often family is um, not necessarily front and center in both of your practices, but Sebastian, you also, you shared how um, the, the passing of your grandfather was sort of what helped lead you into photography as a practice. Um, and uh, I mentioned earlier, there's the new Aperture issue dedicated to Latinx um, photography out. And, and in it, Pilar Tompkins Rivas, who's the guest editor, she has a line, she talks also about um, the role of family photography um, to her own family. And maybe I'll share a little bit about my family, but I'm of Cuban descent. And so there's actually a photographic absence on um, from, from that side of my family, which uh, is, is interesting to think about both what we have and, and what we're missing. But Pilar has a, a sentence where she says that the Latinx journey is not only a process of visibility, but also a process of belonging. So, you know, this word visibility, obviously, I think um, politic, the politics of visibility and represent representation are really important um, for all artists. But I, I'm curious how Pilar kind of um, is playing on that notion. And it's not just about visibility, but also about belonging. Um, I found that present in those juxtaposed um, landscapes of your star, the kind of um, obscured image, and then this idea of what Los Angeles could be for us. So I, I'm just curious what the two of you think about this kind of you know, visibility, belonging in your work, if, if it's something you think about, if you think it might be latent, maybe you've never thought about it before. Please, go ahead. Oh, um, yeah. I think it's extremely important, especially um, for a place like Chicago. You know, I think as I mentioned in, in the panel discussion, we were often, uh, often overlooked, but it, that entirely depends on, on who you're asking. Uh, you know, I think in a larger context, the experience in Chicago is, is, is really not known outside of Chicago. And I think that's really important to amplify because we're also here and, and, and there are uh, extreme connections to all over the place, in, including Texas. Uh, Texas is a big uh, uh, state uh, that we have a relationship with, but but also you know representation and and trying to photograph and talk to people about that um, you know can really lead to other projects and other places that are also a part of this larger story of our experiences in in, in the states. Um, in the example that I can give for that one would be uh, when I was displaced from Pilsen in two thousand nineteen. I asked around, like, where should I go? Where do I go? Uh, I'm still trying to figure that out. Uh, but a lot of folks, they pointed me towards Salinas, California, uh, which is a predominantly farm working community and it's encircled by a, a large agriculture industry. And to me, that was extremely curious because I was talking about where to go and, and the elders and, and the workers in, in a place like Pilsen pointed me to Salinas. So, so I went to Salinas, right? And I think that bridge comes with this, uh, this when you're seeking representation, uh, you know, we're, we're very connected and very close to one another more than we realize. Uh, so, you know, photography is, is an important element to that. Yeah. Um, so for me, um, 
I'm I'm sixth generation Mexican American, and then I'm first generation Mexican American, and I lived in a community like Boyle Heights, where there's I always thought it was fourth generation. Um, and then like I did the research and I just thought, I found out I was, I was fourth, I mean six because of like racist uh, uh, stuff in, in Texas that just denied, um, that said that my great grandfather was Mexican even though he was American. Um, but um, so a lot of my friends were fourth generation um, Mexican too, but, and also then there's, a, there was always like a lot of migrants and I've, I've never felt like I belong, you know? Um, and so I've, I've given up on the idea of really belonging. And I think also that uh, being, uh, staying stagnant, you know, or like, you know, so I, I feel like there's a few of my friends in me that say like, you know, cause when I, there's always that, like that idea of like, you know, you're not American enough and whatever, you know, you are in like the Latinx, you know, once you go back that like there's the rejection. You know, so like for me, I know like, you know, I'm somebody of Lat uh, of of Mexican descent that's in in diaspora. You know, I'm I'm never gonna return. I'm I can't I can't go back to what has been lost. You know, and, and in my family, particularly, you know, there so much has been lost. You know, and I mean physically, you know, spiritually and emotionally you know, um, that it's just gone. So what I can do is try to understand it and then also explain it because it wasn't by accident. You know, there was actual policies in place to hurt uh, black, brown and indigenous people. Um, and for me, um, you know, when I started uh, doing these photographs, I read a lot of like books because I was like, I want to understand this. You know, and so my photos are kind of what I've explained is they're Trojan horses. You know, they they look beautiful, like the one in my background. Um, but then it's like, but why is this private land? Or why do I, as somebody who is indigenous, like when we went to go take this picture, there was like this really scary white ranger that then harassed me and my friend for $5. It's like, but I'm indigenous to this land and you're scaring me for $5, you know, what are the policies in place to scare me, you know? Um, and so I want to understand that and then it kind of spread that. So like this beautiful landscape is like a Trojan horse, just explain these policies, you know, because a photograph will never do everything it can, but it can kind of explain the stuff or lure you in and say like, actually this is systemic racism, you know? And so that's kind of what I want my pictures to do, you know, and my series to do is to lure people in and say, um, yeah, actually there's so much more, ha ha, you're stuck. Now you want to know more, you know? Yeah. Thank you so much for bringing up, I mean, the power of beauty or the double-edged sword of beauty mm -hmm. star. Um, it's interesting. Uh, we recently were able to conduct an oral interview with Charles Biasini Duvera, who's um, the... The only photographer from this uh, Enfoco suite um, who, who's still with us. And he talks a lot about beauty and it, it is very powerful and seductive, but I think you're very rightly and smartly um, nuancing a bit in your work. We're getting a lot of questions coming in. Um, so I, I think I'm going to expand a bit about on, on some of them to, to get to the answers. Um, and I wanted to thank both of you for being so open about your experiences and, and how you came about to your practice and who you're photographing. Um, Haley Duvall asks, do you have someone in mind when you think about, uh, that you think about when you, do you have someone in mind when you think about who you want to see your images? Does that change? And I also, I wanna maybe nuance that a bit and ask both of you about, um, you know, how you like to present your work and I think it's interesting. Both of you are, are in a way um, kind of contrast star. Uh, you know, you showed us some of the gallery views of how you presented your works um, in exhibition spaces. And Sebastian, I know um, as a photojournalist, your work has appeared in print um, and magazines. And so 
you know, do you think about that when you're shooting, like where the end goal is, who's seeing it and in what context? Um, I mean, Star, if, you, if you're ready and you want to go first, just to vary it up. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I, I take a long time for the end, like, I'll shoot, I'll shoot, like, I, like I said, my work takes a very long time to get to the end process, like, sometimes not, sometimes once I'm finishing stuff up, like, you know, certain things will be from this year or something like that. Um, I mean, I've, I've been lucky that um, my work has worked for print, um, for fine art, you know, for journalism, I was trained documentary, you know, so like I do have the documentary eye, but it's like for fine art, but it, it's also like, it's meant to be both in that way, you know, I would love to do books, I just haven't yet, um, but it is storytelling in that way. So, you know, I've, I've shown the work um, mostly in the galleries and then also in print um and then like a lot of times I just do it on my Instagram to kind of like talk about it and uh, like let people know because I feel like I love I love um connecting with photographers on Instagram and chatting with them and like seeing what's going on and then sharing stuff what I'm doing as well because like I think that's like really important like I mean um I feel like most people like we make work by or make money through so many different things um you know that it's also it's good to just like sh share something and say like this is what I'm going through this is the process you know so it's it's really a very you know mm -hmm. and I think it's really interesting I mean Instagram is obviously so powerful but that you're able to um find community uh mm -hmm. through it with other practitioners mm -hmm. um Sebastian do you want to yeah um it's a it's a constant thought on how to deliver particular stories and images. Um, and, you know, I, community, community meetings, community resource centers, it really depends on, on how um, information is spread and how easily it can get on the hands for our intended audience, typically is, is the thing that I think about constantly. Um, and in some cases, a print article in a newspaper might not work it might work but it might not also work there must be uh alternative ways to, uh, that we can work on to uh to share information maybe even more creative ways to share information i have a lot of dreams about what that looks like um and you know i'm currently working right now to 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 kind of step away from not just publishing a story and then moving on to the next thing, but really uh, involving members of, of that particular community, whatever community that I'm working on, to to comment, to really express themselves and and or response to the thing that they're reading or being informed by. So I think, excuse me, it's a constant um, it's a constant thought. Um. Both of you, uh, uh, this is from Anna, uh, whether you can both talk about how loss is conceptualized in your work, whether it's um, family, gentrification, what's lost in diaspora. Mm, can I don't really understand what, like. Do you, uh, how is this, maybe, maybe uh, it's more latent with you, but um, do you, how do you conceptualize this notion of loss is a question we received from the audience, whether it's place or people or the sense of diaspora? Mm. I think it's, um, um, I think it's really important to really acknowledge that something that we built ourselves was, was, technically never intended for us to, to to live in to 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 blossom in and i think to me that that's the thing that is lost is is you know the fruits of our labor you know um we're often creating wonders built from from nothing uh you know and, and that's really a metaphorical way of just trying to uh you know imagine what those things are but with gentrification, it, it really signals to a lot of folks 
uh, that it was never intended for us. And you know, the thing about gentrification and change and loss is that it, it, it's just named differently. Back then it used to be urban renewal. Now it's gentrification. It, all, all of it, it really fosters the same result. Uh, so we're forced to then again, create something uh, new, build new resources for our community. And, and, and um, yeah, I think that's the thing that, that can be lost is that we, we, we have a really hard time of investing in a particular space. You know, like a home is the foundation of human existence is where we learn how to do things, but we're always jumping to place to place and we're never really rooting ourselves in, in one particular thing. And that's such a tragedy, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's something that just keeps on going and recycles and that, that's the thing that needs to change. Uh, um, for me, like, I mean, loss was something I just, I grew up with, like, and it was, it was supposed to be something I was supposed to accept, you know, like, I mean, when you grow up with, um, you know, I grew up in the 90s, you know, and I mean, it was just, it felt like people were getting murdered, like, you know, every day that we knew in our community. And even before that, there was just so many fa family members from my family that had just died. When I would ask my, my mother and my grandmother why, they would just say, it's just the way it was. And for me, I just, I could never accept that. I was just always so angry about it. And so for me, when, um, when I started to take photographs, it was really just to kind of confront confront what's going on in my existence you know I started to photograph uh well, I started to really photograph when I was like 14 or 15 with throwaway cameras and then I got my first um SLR when I was 16 um and I was really just confronting my existence and, and my life that was going on because I just didn't I didn't I couldn't comprehend that um you know I didn't want to be silenced and um I also, I, you know, I would look at images. I remember like, you know, when you would go like on AOL and I would be like East LA photos or East LA photographers, like, you know, just those really crappy like searches. And it would just like be like, you know, those pictures that you see of people's mug shots. And I would get so upset, you know, because I wanted to understand, I wanted to see myself reflected. And I just, you know, now you see that there is like people making work, you know, since like the 80s and 70s, but, you know, now the monographs are coming, but it, then it just, it didn't exist. And so I was like, I want to document my existence and I want to document like loss of just, you know, my innocence or my anger, you know, because I had been born into so much loss. And so for me, it was really a resistance of, 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 of accepting loss, you know, and, and in my lifetime as a photographer, I've, I've been a photographer more longer since I've existed. I'm 34 now. Um, so 18 years, um, you know, unfortunately I've documented the loss of my mother, um, the loss of my aunt, you know, um, my, I said my grandmother, I found out she passed away. Unfortunately, I, I didn't get to see her, but so many people have died. Um, and it's really sad, but it's it's confronting, not not accepting that that loss um, idly, like really confronting it, you know, and being able to speak on it. And I feel like a lot of uh, my family members who were still suffering from addiction, they're like, you just gotta uh, you gotta accept it and then just kind of numb yourself. And I was just like, no, you know, like no, I I won't accept it in that on those terms, you know. And um, my camera really has helped me in that way. And imagery, you know, not just the camera, but also like looking at archival images and connecting them. I think that's so interesting. I think so often we think about um, photographs as preservation, as memory. I mean, a lot of times nostalgia too, but I think this idea of confronting um, is really something that's not often talked about. Um, so I think- And resistance too, you know? Yeah. Um, Star, you mentioned, uh, I, I know we're kind of at time, but I think in since our conversation is going well, hopefully uh, you all can stay with us for a little bit longer because we have great questions. Um, I was really interested. I, I'm also, you know, grew up in the 90s and I think it's fascinating, Star, how 
in a way, the internet was a reference for you. You were looking at images on the internet, even though you were rejecting what you were seeing. But I wanted to ask both of you, you know, did you have um, particular mentors uh, or were there particular photographers whose work you, you were inspired by or who you look up to today or who you, know, you feel like are also you know, telling the kind of stories that you're interested in? Please go, go ahead. Yeah, I feel like I went first last time. <laughs> it's all oh. natural, <laughs> as natural as it can be on Zoom. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of people that influence me every single day, um, you know, so the people that I need in front of the camera to, to my friends, um, particular mentors, I think I have to give a lot of credit uh, for allowing me to be a photojournalist professionally to begin with to to William Carmago uh, in, in, uh, in LA in Anaheim. Um, he lived in Chicago for uh, a couple of years and and he was one of the first editors um to to really give me a shot you know and it allowed me to make mistakes and and i think it's because he he understood where i was coming from and uh, you know I, I i don't think uh um i think it would have been even more difficult if it wasn't you know for his support but um uh, you know a lot of the other influencers um, and the people that I needed, you know, they inspire me every single day. They don't necessarily have to be photographers. They could be um, writers and painters and poets and even teachers and, um, you know, uh, activists or people who have, uh, who really, you know, understand something and, and try to make something of it. I think that's something that really inspires me in and something that I also look, uh, for and, and, and those I want to just surround myself by. Um, so it's a lot, you know, it's a, uh, we're very a tight community, um, even at everyone, you know, and uh, I think we're just in this together and, you know, I have to give them a lot of credit because they're my primos and stuff, you know. <laughs> um, early on, um... You know, yeah, it was, it had to be my friends. My professors were very confused by my work. Um, you know, it was, it was very interesting. It was, uh, the school I went to was East Los Angeles College, which I love deeply, but it was mostly older white men um, who uh, got trained at technical photo school, which was great because I learned all the technical stuff, but um they just did not understand the imagery I was doing and they just like would get so frustrated with me um so like you know just having to check in with my friends um that was really frustrating because that was a few years of that um in LA um and then when I transferred to School of Visual Arts um one of my professors Robert Stevens at taught me there he knew joseph rodriguez from icp and i got to meet joseph rodriguez and he um instantly understood what i was doing and he was actually the first photographer that i i i got to see the work and he's i saw that he was doing work in um los angeles in the 90s um and he really just mentored me and and he pushed me to to make my work just more and, and do more and and I, I always say like, he's an inspiration and a mentor to me because, you know, from the first time he met me, I think he thought like, I was like a, like a private rich, rich like kid from uh, SVA. And then I told him where I was from. And then his, uh, he changed a little bit like, oh, okay, you're, you're not just like, um, you know, coming here just to kind of talk about the work. You're actually really coming here because you're very, you're very serious. Um, so Joseph Rodriguez really um, helped mentor me and, you know, like in the same way, like, you know, I, I read a lot. I, I think a lot about theory, you know, like I love photographers, but I, when I'm, when I'm doing my work, I, I actually read more. I think, I think a lot more about theory because then I, it just kind of helps take away the no the, the noise in that way you know it just it just helped me in that way um so that's why I also wanted to like shout out like bell hooks because like you know when I'm like 
getting close to like a deadline, I would like put on a lot of her talks, you know, and just listen to it. So to help me remind me what it's all for. Yes. Shout out to Bell Hooks. I actually meant to start this um, <laughs> with, a, with a quote, but I'll save it for the closing. Um, I know, again, we're getting over time, but we have a couple good questions. Um, and I also, I wanted to ask both of you, you know, of course, all of our lives have changed these past two years, um, but I'm curious, you know, how this particular moment or maybe, you know, the past two years, how and if that's inflected your work. Um, thinking also uh, Holland Carter, it was really interesting to me in his review of the top exhibitions of 2021. He actually ended it by not talking about an exhibition at all. And he shouted out to all the photojournalists and uh, I'll extend it to all photographers out there who he thought was doing, you know, the most critical work at this particular time. And I'm, I'm kind of curious, yeah, like, what is this moment for you all? How is it inflecting your practice? But, well, for me, it's like, it's, it's really destroyed my practice. I'm immune compromised. And, uh, you know, half my practice is, is working on the personal and then half of it is is with my community, and um, as a mean compromised person, I just I I can't go out there. I I I get yeah. I I I rather I rather risk two or three years inside um, and then go back out there um, than you know than die. You know I mean I see my mother die from an infection, so you know that really that really stays with you in that way. Um, I had did a talk early on in, in the pandemic and um, what, what sticks with me the most is, you know, um, lower income communities and black and brown folks are dying, you know, at a disproportionate rate. And I know there's people that I'm, I won't be able to photograph and, you know, talk to that will die, you know, and, um, you know, they're just forgotten, they're forgotten, you know, by the mainstream on purpose, you know, um, and I, I think about all those folks, you know, I think about like, you know, um, I'm lucky right now, I'm, I'm a professor right now, um, and I teach, and so I've been able to stay inside, and that hasn't been the case always, just right now, I feel lucky, you know, um, and I've turned down jobs, you know, um, I feel like I don't really get called that much um, to do uh, journalist stuff, because they're like, oh, she's probably not gonna do anything, and that sucks, but, you know, at the same time, like I said, I'm, I rather live, you know, um, but I also think of, like I said, the people that are just forgotten on purpose, you know, so for me, I, I think about those people all the time, like my dad's a custodian at a hospital right now, and, you know, I'm always, like, trying to be careful, you know, so, I mean, it's, it's destroyed half of my practice, but I know as long as I'm alive, one day it will be there again, you know, so I know that's not the case for everybody, but for me it is, you know. Um, yeah, I only had like a week off during the beginning of the pandemic, uh, and, and then I was off again, and I think, uh, um, it hasn't necessarily destroyed my practice, more so it's destroyed my, my kind of personal life. Um, I think that's also something that photographers need to be aware of is, is, you know, understanding the choices that they make and the consequences or the thing that, uh, you know, those choices have certain elements to it and understanding what those elements are is, uh, is worth investing in. And, and I think early on, I made the choice to, to work. I made the choice to to really get out there and see uh, for myself, and uh, now you know uh, I have certain fears going outside uh, because I was just always outside with a mask on. Uh, I still wear my masks, um, you know, and 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 I learned a lot. But I think right now the thing that I'm I'm wrecking with uh is is very just personal and i think and i'm, look, I'm looking forward to these holidays because <laughs> i could just sleep in <laughs> yes we can all definitely use some rest i know it's it's a long end of the year maybe to end things on a positive or um you know an inspirational note 
Um, we have a question from Richard Gonzalez, who's asking if, who's an aspiring artist, um, if you have any advice on making and sharing your art. Uh, you know, I, I, I tend to give similar advice uh, to my students all the time is, is, you know, establishing relationships is extremely important, especially in photojournalism world. Um, so to actively seek them out and invest in those relationships. But the thing that you can do now is really start extremely small, uh, very, very small, so small that you can do it like right now, right? Um, you know, invest in relationships with, with your peers that have similar, if not the same interests as you and collaborate that way. Make your stories, You're like don't worry about uh, money just yet. I mean, worry about money, make a living for yourself. But you know, that, that those things come secondary uh, and they will eventually come. You just have to really trust in those processes and start very, very small. That, that would be the advice that I would give um, aspiring photojournalists. Yeah, I mean, connecting with people, like like you said, um, I always tell my students to have a website, even a free, a free website. I feel like that's always really important. Link it with your Instagram page, you know, because people are always looking for your website, you know, making sure your Instagram, you know, like has some of your work. And, you know, yeah, just like when you meet people, like, I don't know, like when I was first starting out, you know, I still had a normal job, but like, I would go to like little events, you know, I would find out like, I mean, I first started going to like little gallery shows and I would just like be curious, like, you know, like I went to like talks like this, you know, right now it's in, it's on Zoom, but I, in person, you just chat with people and being curious, like, like, most of my friends were friends from like growing up and then you meet your like little art friends and you know, you start collaborating, you know, like, oh, let's do a shoot or let's make art or, you know, just stuff like that, you know, and then it slowly becomes like a whole thing, you know, and it just, it would become an obsession with me, you know, and then we went to go look um, at portfolios and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> um so you know it, it's like it's all like stuff like that um you know and so I mean I have all different types of friends now but you know like there's your obsessive art friends where you're like okay we're gonna go to Texas and make work for a week and be miserable but you know like that's just you know and then it works out you know yeah I yeah. think I mean this idea of collaboration and community I mean that's you know it, what brought us together for this particular um, program. So maybe that, that's a good place for us to end the conversation. It was so great. I wanna thank both of you for sharing your images and telling us a little bit about your stories and how they inflect your practices. Um, and again, to invite the audience to please come um, if you're in the New York area and you can make it to visit and FOCO. Um, it's a really special portfolio that hasn't been shown in full since 1978. So it's, it's a real treat. Um, please stay tuned to El Museo del Barrio. We're gonna be doing another one of these programs linking um, past history of Latinx photography with current histories um, still in the making um, and a really exciting field. And um, Star, again, thank you for bringing up Bell Hooks. Um, I know that her words are on a lot of our minds. So I did have um, a quote that she offered about photography that maybe we can end on. Um, this is from her essay in Our Glory, Photography and Black Life. Uh, and she talks about photography as an ongoing struggle and says, um, such is the power of the photograph of the image that it can give back and take away and that it can bind. So I think maybe on, on Bell's provocative and poetic and revolutionary words, thank you all again and um, hope to see you soon and a restful and happy end of the year to all of us. <laughs> so thank thanks to all my colleagues at El Museo, especially in public programs for making this happen. Thanks, Star. Thank thanks, you. Sebastian. All right, y'all. Take it easy. <laughs> Stay well. <laughs>